socialism taught by the Shao Collective. And the final class will be on June 14th, uh, China and the Global South, Internationalism and Multilateralism Amidst U.S. Aggression Taught by the Chow Collective. Thanks, and as Satya said, I will be co-facilitating today's class. Just so everyone is aware, this class is also being live streamed. So if folks are watching on Facebook or Twitter, we ask that you take a moment to share the live stream and invite others to tune in. The Party for Socialism and Liberation is organizing this class series along with the Chow Collective as part of a response to the outrageous demonization campaign against China that continues to grow amidst this crisis. We invite all those watching to find out more about both organizations and to get involved with the struggle today. Please visit chowcollective.com. Chow is spelled Q-I-A-O for more information about the Chow Collective and pslweb.org to learn about the Party for Socialism and Liberation. So before we begin today, we want everyone to be ready to come out to demand that the federal government cancel the rents on May 30th in cities across the United States. The patchwork of city and state moratoriums on evictions are not enough. In a few months, when these moratoriums are lifted and the rents come due, we will still not have the money. Join thousands of people across the country in car caravan protests on Saturday, May 30th, to demand the cancellation of rent, mortgages, and all debts to landlords for the duration of the pandemic. Protesters will adhere to, the, to social distancing guidelines and requirements, including wearing masks that have been established to risk to respond to the coronavirus outbreak. Read more about the protests and find an action near you at canceltherents.org. You can also sign the petition on the website. Ken Hammond and Sheila Shao will be our presenters for our first class. Ken Hammond is a PSL member in Las Cruces, New Mexico. He is a professor of East Asian and Global History at New Mexico State University and former director of the Confucius Institute. Sheila Shao is a member of the PSL Central Committee. She also works in public higher education as an institutional researcher. So today's class will consist of two lectures, each followed by 15 minutes of Q&A. For each Q&A session, we will open up for questions and comments. Any questions not answered during the Q&A session will be answered via email as we only have 15 minutes for each Q&A session. Webinar participants, please write your questions into the chat. Candice and I will present the questions to the presenters to respond during the question and answer time. So Ken Hammond will be presenting the first lecture on the opium war and the end of the world, the old order the Taiping Rebellion and Efforts at Reform. Please welcome Ken. Greetings, comrades. Glad to be here today uh, to talk about uh, this history, which is both interesting and fascinating in its own right, but of course, especially important to us now in an era when the uh, bourgeois elites in America and the West are you know, ramping up their propaganda against China and creating an environment that threatens to take us into uh, and, you know, a, a new Cold War or a new World War, we want to try to overcome that. Uh, and one way to do that, of course, is to empower ourselves by knowing uh, about China and about modern Chinese history. So that's where we want to start today. And can we bring up the first of the slides, please? There we go. Okay. All right, um, this is just our, our title here, uh, From Opium Wars to Trade Wars. And in this first week, we're gonna talk about these three basic things, the Opium War and the end of the old order, the old order being the, the imperial order in China. Uh, then as, a, as an outgrowth of that, we'll talk about the first great popular rebellion of the modern period, the Taiping Rebellion in the middle of the 19th century. 
And after that, we'll take a look for a little bit at some efforts on the part of the, the Qing dynasty, the last of the imperial dynasties, to try to reform itself uh, in the face of Western imperialist aggression. Uh, so let's go on to the next uh, slide. I wanna use this uh, slide to just put us into a broad context, okay? This is a slide that just, it's a graph that shows changes in the share of gross domestic product, global productivity basically, uh, on a global scale uh, uh, over a very long time, but particularly over the last 500 years. Uh, and what you can see, and uh, we'll just look at this for a moment, is there's this red line, that's, the, the, uh, that's China. Uh, and uh, all the way down till the beginning of the 19th century, we can see that China contributes a vast amount to global economic productivity, peaking uh, early in the 19th century at about a third, over 30%. While uh, India also was a, a major contributor for a long time, down until late in the 18th century. We see the rise of Western Europe there going on over a long period of time, but accelerating at the beginning of the 19th century. And at about the same time, we see that dark blue line for the United States starting a dramatic rise as well. What we see there is, is, is the history that we're gonna talk about, at least part of it, in a very simple encapsulated form. Because what happens at the beginning of the 19th century, of course, is the Industrial Revolution and the dramatic change in global power relationships that follows upon that. That leads to this collapse of the position of China in, in global affairs, the rise of the West, and that persists over the next century and a half. But then if we look to the right side of the chart, we can see that beginning uh, after 1950, that collapse comes to an end. And then beginning uh, in, the, in the 70s, China begins its, its, its dramatic modern rise, while the West, uh, the US and Europe are on a, uh, now on a declining scale. And this has to do with the victory of the liberation struggle in 1949, the efforts to build socialism, and uh, of course the, uh, the, the erosion uh, that goes along with that of the dominance, the hegemony that the United States and the West had established uh, up to that point. So this is just a very, very basic uh, graphic image that shows how things were up until uh, the early 19th century, how dramatically they changed, but how now the world is returning uh, to patterns that are perhaps more, uh, more familiar or more, more similar to what they were in the past as China leads the way to a new era of productivity, a new era of, of building socialism. And we'll talk about uh, uh, the, all the, the, the sort of fine details of this as we go along. Okay, we have the next slide, please. Yeah, the first thing I wanna talk about today is the Opium War. We'll talk a little bit about the background of trade with the West, um, then what changes? What is it that makes, uh, you know, sets the stage for this dramatic transformation? And that's two things, the rise of the ideology of free trade. And of course, as I just mentioned, the industrial revolution, which gives the British first and then other Western powers a dramatically enhanced capability to project military power so that they can enforce these doctrines of free trade on Asian countries and other countries around the world, and then flood their economies with low cost, inexpensive mass produced factory goods, eroding and undermining their domestic economies and creating uh, the, the global division of labor uh, in which the colonies and the oppressed peoples are, are both sources of raw materials and markets for uh, European and American uh, industrial products. Okay, so that's, that's the beginning of this process we're gonna look at. Now the next slide, please. This just gives us an idea of the extent to which already by the 18th century, trade had been developed on a global scale. And up to that time, uh, Europe had, had participated in this, uh, obviously, especially in the Western hemisphere. Can, yeah, can we bring the, uh, the uh, slide up just a little bit? There we go. Um, uh, especially in the Western hemisphere, the Spanish and the Portuguese had created these vast empires, the English, the French had come in later. Um, but uh, in Asia, uh, uh, whether South Asia, Southeast Asia, East Asia, 
the Europeans had found that what they had to do was to integrate themselves with the long established political and economic orders uh, that were in place there, which meant that they, they were making tremendous amounts of money, British uh, uh, businessmen, British uh, entrepreneurs, uh, and other Europeans were out in the world with their monopoly companies, uh, making a lot of money in the trade in Asia, between Asia, one country and another in Asia, between Asia and Europe. And this went on, this had gone on for two or three centuries already. But in that context, the, the, the center of production, and, and, and China really was the most uh, advanced economy, the most productive economy in the world, most of the things that Europeans wanted were being produced in China, whether this was silks or ceramics or tea or uh, other kinds of, uh, of manufactured goods. <coughs> China had a very advanced and sophisticated commercial economy, a, a early form of, uh, of manufacturing ca uh, capitalism. And uh, those were the goods that, uh, that the Westerners wanted, but the West didn't have things to trade with China. And so uh, they were always having to bring silver. Uh, a lot of the silver that was mined in the new world in the Spanish colonies wound up one way or another, making its way to China for the purchase of Chinese uh, manufactured goods. Next slide, please. In 1793, the British, uh, King George III, sends a mission to China and uh, led by a fellow named McCartney, George McCartney. And, uh, and uh, Lord McCartney uh, uh, has an audience with the emperor of China, the Qianlong Emperor, in which he presents a letter from George III asking the Chinese to open their economy to British uh, commercial interests. Uh, at this point, Trade could only take place in one port, the port of Guangzhou in the far south. Uh, the, the British wanted uh, ports all up and down the coast open. They wanted to establish a diplomatic mission at Beijing. Uh, but uh, but uh, the Qianlong Emperor said, uh, thanks, thanks for your interest, but no thanks. We, we are happy to trade with you. We're happy to, to uh, have you come and buy our goods, but, but we have everything that we need and we want here. And, and we really just, we're happy with things the way they are. And at this point, uh, the emperor writes back to the, to the king and, and tells him, you know, tells him these things. But uh, it, it just uh, doesn't, uh, it doesn't change anything at this point in time, okay? But this is right on the threshold of the, the big changes that are, that are gonna transform global relations. And if we can look at the next slide, I don't know if we can, I'm not sure how these appear to people. I don't know if we can make these any bigger or, or full screen or something like that. Let's see. Things are morphing. <laughs> there we go, there we go. All right, that's looking good. Keep going, one, next, next, next. Here we are, right there. Nope, go back to industrial revolution. The next slide, there we go. So, at the, at the latter part of the 18th century, beginning of the 19th century, we have the Industrial Revolution taking place in Britain first, then spreading to Western Europe, North America. Uh, but it's the British that lead the way here. And there's all sorts of debates about this. A lot of the uh, capital for the Industrial Revolution is looted from India as the British are ramping up their colonial activities there. Also generated by the slave plantations in the Caribbean, the sugar industry there. Uh, there's a lot of money uh, available in, uh, in Britain and, and that is used to, uh, to develop new technologies of production, in particular, the use of steam engines. Uh, and the, the abundant supply of coal, which happened to be located in England, meant that uh, they could take advantage of these technologies at fairly low cost. And this revolutionized uh, production. And Marx, of course, writes extensively about this uh, in, the, in the final chapters of, uh, of Capital. Um, at the same time, uh, and not coincidentally at the same time, new ideas about 
economics were beginning to, to take hold, in particular the ideas of Adam Smith, who published his book, The Wealth of Nations in 1776, advocating the idea of free trade, that uh, basically saying that an English businessman should be able to go wherever he wanted, trade with whomever he wanted, uh, without any, any limitations being imposed. Okay, can we see the next slide? Now, what that came down to in reality was not the selling of British manufactured goods, at least initially to China, because they still uh, were not of interest to the Chinese. The Chinese had their own textile industry, their own manufacturing industries in a variety of ways. But the British who had taken over uh, parts of India already by this time, uh, were driving Indian manufacturers out of the cotton industry and forcing farmers there to grow opium instead. They test marketed that opium down in Malaya, where what they found was that overseas Chinese laborers were their best customers. And based upon that, they decided that, well, maybe we could sell opium in China. They started importing opium into China at the end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century. And indeed found that there was a, a significant demand for opium in China. Now, opium was illegal in China. The Chinese knew about opium and known about it for, for centuries. And uh, although they had medicinal applications for it as a, as a, as a recreational drug, uh, it was outlawed, it was banned. Nonetheless, the British began to smuggle it in, uh, sneaking it passed to the official trade center at Guangzhou using a variety of, of uh, backstream uh, uh, routes. They, they smuggled it in and uh, eventually about 10% of the population in southern China uh, became uh, addicted. Next slide, please. Obviously, the, from the Chinese point of view, this was not a good thing. Um, not only was it a social problem because people were having, uh, you know, uh, issues about getting the money to feed their addiction and people were, were you know, losing their, their, their focus in life and, and all sorts of, of issues like that. But the demand for opium, the British demanded that when they sold opium, when they smuggled it in, that they be paid in silver. And so what that did was it reversed the balance of payments, the flow of silver, which for centuries had been into China, now China starts to lose silver out to the British. That was, you know, a serious disruption of China's economy, the beginning of serious disruptions of China's domestic economy. The emperor, the Daoguang emperor, uh, uh, decided that something had to be done about this. And in the, about 1836, he uh, asked his officials to give him advice. Uh, the fellow here on the right, Lin Zexu, uh, gave uh, had a, a set of policy proposals that the emperor liked, and he was made uh, the imperial commissioner for opium, sent down to Guangzhou, where he made efforts to uh, stop the trade, to control the trade, including uh, confiscating opium stocks from British ships as they came into the region and burning it, destroying it. Uh, so he, uh, he was uh, very aggressive in trying to block these efforts by the Western imperialists to, uh, to introduce this, this, this drug uh, into the domestic markets. Okay, next slide, please. Next slide. There we go. Um, Parliament, uh, uh, you know, the, obviously the British traders in, uh, in uh, Guangzhou or Canton, as it's uh, marked on this map, um, were very upset about this. And they petitioned Parliament. They complained to their, their uh, agents in, in, in London. And so Parliament debated how to respond to this situation. And of course, they didn't. Uh, Parliament doesn't get up. People don't get up in Parliament and say, well, we have to protect the freedom of drug dealers. They got up and they said, well, this is a matter of principle. This is a matter of free trade. And so uh, eventually uh, uh, the parliament uh, voted, yes, we will send the Navy, we will send the Royal Navy to China to ensure that the Chinese understand that they have to be modern and they have to open up and embrace uh, our, our desire for free trade. And so that's exactly what they did. They sent the Navy over. And of course, this was now uh, this is 1839, 1840. 
the Royal Navy has now become the most powerful Navy in the world. It has modern industrial uh, weaponry, big cannons, big guns. Uh, the soldiers on board have modern firearms. Uh, and it's, they, you know, this, this is part of the Industrial Revolution. It's not just changing uh, the production of, of, uh, of, uh, of goods, uh, but also changing warfare, changing military technology. And so basically, uh, for a couple of years, the Royal Navy sails up and down the coast, uh, shells harbors, destroys cities, uh, and, and intimidates and humiliates uh, the, the military forces of the, of the Qing dynasty. Next slide. In 1842, the Qing dynasty is finally compelled to sign a treaty, and this is known as the Treaty of Nanjing. Uh, Nanjing is a, a former imperial capital, a city a little west of where modern day Shanghai is. And the Treaty of Nanjing is important because it does, it does a number of things that still sort of reverberate down to our own time. Um, the Qing Dynasty is forced to agree to open five ports to British merchants. Uh, they are forced to cede the island of Hong Kong to Britain. This is where Hong Kong comes into being. It had been a, a minor fishing village before that, but now it becomes uh, the center for British imperialism, for British colonialism uh, in East Asia. Uh, and of course, the legacy of that remains with us down to the present day. The Treaty of Nanjing incorporates a, something called the principle of extraterritoriality, which said that Westerners would not be subject to Chinese law, but would be tried if they committed a crime by their own people. And it also included something called the No Most Favored Nation Clause, which said that if any other country negotiated a treaty with China, then they got concessions that weren't originally in this treaty, the British would get those as well. So it, it was a way of ensuring that any further developments in, in imperialist encroachment would, would come to the British as well. And indeed the United States, which were the second biggest uh, drug dealers in, uh, in this trade, uh, uh, signed a treaty just two years later, which got further concessions and those accrued to the British as well. Um, the opium, of course, as I said, was illegal in, uh, in uh, China at this time was also illegal in both uh, the United States and, uh, uh, and Britain for non-medicinal purposes. It had legal applications for, for uh, medicinal purposes, but not, uh, not for recreation. Okay, next slide, please. Now, the Opium War, the defeat of the Qing Dynasty, the, the military humiliation of China by the British was also a, a great political and cultural shock. Um, and this continued, this wasn't just a, a one-off of course, there were, there were subsequent uh, confrontations, further treaties, the ongoing erosion uh, of China's sovereignty and the imposition of the power of, of the West, of, of the imperialist countries uh, on uh, uh, on China. Other, other ports had to be open to other Western powers and uh, uh, perhaps most significantly in, in some ways, um, not just uh, trade came, but uh, Western missionaries and, and, uh, and other sorts of, of cultural intrusions that were going on as well. That disrupted China's uh, domestic social order. It, it caused uh, massive unemployment in, in areas of the economy where cheap Western goods began to flood in and, and people who had been working in textiles or ceramics or other areas were, were out of a job. Um, people who had worked in transport domestically to bring things down to Guangzhou in the South lost their jobs. One particular group of people called the Hot which was a, a sort of ethnic community in the South, people who had migrated down earlier from the North. Many of them were displaced. And one of them, a gentleman named Hong Shou Chuan, uh, became the leader of what we call the Taiping Rebellion. He had been influenced by uh, Protestant missionaries in Guangzhou. Uh, the fellow pictured here, Timothy Richard, uh, is one that we're pretty sure was in, in communication with Hong Shou Chuan. Um, but Hong Shou Chuan had a vision that told him that he was the younger brother of Jesus Christ, and he needed to lead a rebellion to establish a kind of Christian kingdom uh, in China. Uh, and, and that's what he sets about trying to do. And can we see the next slide? This is the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom, the Heavenly Kingdom of Great Peace. 
which starts out as a, as a kind of a rural commune in the South, uh, but uh, after that brings them into conflict with local authorities that leads to an overall military uprising. They march North. Eventually uh, you can see on the map here, this encompasses huge chunks of central and Southern China. Uh, they eventually establish a capital for themselves at Nanjing, the same place where the Treaty of Nanjing had been signed. And they set about trying to create a, uh, a kind of, uh, of kingdom, heavenly kingdom uh, on earth. Next slide, please. The Taiping government and the Taiping regime was, a, was a, a, an early form of popular rebellion. Uh, trying to overthrow both the old imperial order and drive out the Western imperialists. And they had a vision of an egalitarian society. Um, it was not fully developed. It couldn't be really in that, in that period of time. The, the circumstances just weren't right. Uh, but they did make uh, a number of interesting sort of social experiments. Unfortunately, uh, the Taiping uh, uh, political leadership recreated many of the hierarchical uh, divisions that, that were characteristic of imperial China. Uh, and that led to alienation between the, the leadership and, and the masses of the movement, uh, which allowed <clears throat> the imperial state, the Qing state, to eventually suppress uh, the Taiping uh, rebellion. By 1864, it was crushed and the dynasty was able to, uh, to survive this threat. But it was a, a strong indication of how deeply frustrated and alienated many of the, many of the ordinary people of China uh, were at this time. Okay, next slide. So after the destruction of the Taipings, uh, which took a, a couple of years to, to complete, there were also uprisings in other parts of China, uh, particularly by, by Muslim communities in the Southwest in Yunnan province, or in the far West out there in Xinjiang, uh, which of course remains an area uh, where there are um, uh, Islamic separatist activities today that are of some concern, uh, and, and also in places like Shandong province in, on, on the East Coast. Um, the Western countries uh, who had initially thought maybe, maybe having a Christian rebellion in China would be a good thing, realized that Hong Xiaotuan was not, he wasn't a Christian of the kind that they wanted him to be. Uh, and so they decided to not support the Taiping rebels, but instead to continue to aid the Qing dynasty, using, of course, that pressure that the rebellion put on the state to extract further concessions from uh, uh, from the uh, uh, from the dynasty. Okay, next slide. In the midst of this, okay, so even while they're fighting against the Taiping Rebellion, the Western powers, in this case the British and the French together, launch a second opium war. There was an incident in 1856 called the Arrow Incident. The Arrow is the name of a ship. Uh, and uh, uh, there was an incident with customs inspectors uh, going aboard it, uh, but it was flying a British flag, even though it was a Chinese ship that led to all sorts of tensions. Um, a treaty is agreed in 1858, the Treaty of Tianjin to further open ports and further uh, 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 grant further concessions, but the Chinese did not implement those concessions fast enough and so in 1859 and 60, uh, the British and the French invaded the North. The court, the Imperial court fled from Beijing out to Xi'an in the West. And the, uh, you, the, the Western military forces, the Anglo-French forces occupied Beijing and burned and destroyed uh, the emperor's uh, summer palace. You can see the ruins of that in the picture in the middle on, uh, or on the bottom here on the right. Um, and this is a, uh, the ruins are, those ruins are still there as a, as a sort of visual legacy of this era of, of imperialist uh, power, imperialist domination, and uh, what the Chinese often refer to as the century of humiliation. Uh, the burning of the summer palace was an iconic episode in that. Uh, once again, another treaty the, called the, the Convention of Beijing was signed. Um, and that, uh, that uh, further uh, uh, opened China to, uh, to imperialist uh, domination. The, the Westerners took over control of the revenue system, of the tariff system, uh, and basically began to run a lot of these things uh, in, their own, uh, in their own interest. Okay, next slide. <clears throat> 
The 1860s is a period where the Chinese uh, and, and the Manchus, the, the rulers of the Qing dynasty were, were, were people called the Manchus, a different ethnicity, um, uh, and tried to make some reforms. A new emperor came to the throne in 1862 who was not a hands-on ruler. He had uh, physical and mental limitations, which meant that uh, nobles, members of the nobility, uh, exercised power on his behalf. So there was a strong council of what we call regents. And they undertook a series of initiatives, a series of reforms. They created something called the Zongli Yaman, which was uh, sort of the first foreign office uh, for the Chinese government. They empowered, uh, gave greater powers to local provincial leaders, sort of a decentralization, and they pushed a campaign of military modernization. And initially this had the support of uh, a very influential woman uh, who remained powerful for the rest of, uh, of the dynasty, uh, the Empress Dowager Cixi, it's a hard name to pronounce, but that's how C-I-X-I is pronounced, Cixi, her Manchu name was Yehonala. Um, last slide for, for my part. What this leads to is what's called the self-strengthening movement. And this was an effort on the part of the Qing dynasty to build up its strength in ways that would allow it to stand up to the West. The humiliation that the Qing had suffered repeatedly at the hands of the West uh, had convinced at least some officials, and these are just three of the, the leaders of this movement, Li Hongzhang, Zhang Zhidong, and Zhou Zongtang, uh, that China needed to strengthen itself. And so they, they did things on the picture on the bottom left is, is an armory that they built to develop their own weapons. You can see them with this Chinese made cannon on the right. Um, they wanted China to be able to have the military power to not simply be bullied and pushed around and dominated by the Western imperialist states. These efforts would persist in the 1860s and 70s and 80s, and they achieved some modernizations, they achieved some progress, but the self-strengtheners were a minority within the imperial political leadership. And there were other reactionary elements that simply wanted to hang on to their own power and preserve the way things had always been done, who didn't uh, fully perhaps uh, take uh, the, the threat of Western imperialism as seriously as they needed to. And so the self-strengthening movement, while it had some accomplishments, doesn't radically transform uh, the Qing dynasty, but still leaves it vulnerable to further attacks and manipulations uh, by, the, by the West. Uh, that's what I'm going to talk about for my part today. I'll be happy. Uh, I think we have about 15 minutes for questions. And then uh, 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 Comrade Sheila is going to take us on down uh, into the early 20th century. All right, so All right. Um, thank you for that excellent presentation, uh, Ken. Uh, we now have some time for uh, Q&A. So we, we have just about 15 minutes for Q&A just because we have another uh, speaker who still has to present. Um, so we have a few questions that uh, came up in the chat. Sure. Um, I have about five questions here, uh, Ken, or about six. Do you want me to uh, give you three at a time? Sure, that's good. And All right. Try to get through quickly. <laughs> okay. So uh, the first question I have here is about the GDP, the GDP graph that you had shown in the beginning yes. of the presentation. So uh, someone uh, asked, where does this data come from? Uh, the second question I have here is, uh, so where did the opium, um, the, the influx that was coming into China, uh, where did that originate from? Was that sure. from India? Yep. And then the third question I have here is, was the Treaty of Nanjing supported uh, by Chinese politicians uh, or, or factions within the, the Chinese kind of political establishment at the time, or was it driven solely by uh, the British uh, and their kind of military power? Good, good. Oh, those are great questions. Um, the first one's real simple. The, uh, the chart, the graph is based on um, historical work done largely by a fellow named Angus Madison, who I'm sorry is not with us on the planet anymore, but uh, did a lot of great work in the late 20th century. Um, taught at the uh, UN University in Norway and uh, uh, published a lot of material on global economic history. Uh, 
uh, long-term global economic history going back a couple of thousand years. Uh, and that particular chart is, uh, is extracted from um, some, of his, uh, uh, some of his statistical modeling. Uh, there, if, if you uh, uh, go on to, uh, if you just Google, uh, uh, you know, global GDP percentage historical or something like that, you'll see there's lots of versions of that. And they all basically track the same, uh, the same data. But yeah, that's, that's largely based on Madison's research. Um, the opium, yeah, the opium that, that's coming into uh, China is coming from India. The East India Company, which was a, a state monopoly uh, company that had been founded back in, in 1600, had been operating uh, all around the Indian Ocean and especially in India itself uh, over the previous uh, couple of hundred years, had begun to ramp up its activity in the latter part of the 18th century and had taken over uh, the province of Bengal, which was the center of the cotton textile industry. Well, Britain wanted to uh, be ramping up its own cotton textile industry. So the EIC did two things. It broke down the existing cotton production in India, which was the highest quality textiles in the world. Uh, uh, made farmers stop growing cotton. The English could buy cotton, of course, from the slave plantations of the American South, uh, which they did. Uh, which, of course, further uh, enhanced or exacerbated the, the conditions of slavery there. That's a whole story in its own right. Um, but those farmers then uh, had to grow something, and the EIC encouraged them to grow opium. And so they had this huge supply of opium, much more than they could market within India. Uh, they found that China was a uh, receptive uh, audience, and so they started shipping it over there in larger and larger and larger uh, volume. Uh, and, uh, and it became the single largest source of profit for the East India Company. It was the, which the East India Company, of course, ruled India until 1857 as its own private corporate colony. And, and uh, most of the funds, the majority of funds that were used to administer India were derived from the opium trade. So it was a vastly profitable uh, enterprise. Okay. Um, what was the third question again? <laughs> Satya, what was the third question again? You're muted. The third question was about the Treaty of Nanjing and whether it was supported oh, by oh, right. Okay, right, right. Yeah, there was a lot of debate um, within, uh, within uh, uh, the, the, the political elite of the Qing. Uh, there were those who, there, there were sort of three positions. There, was, there were hardliners who absolutely didn't want to have any treaty. They said, you know, we'll just, we'll just tough it out and eventually the British will get tired and go away, which wasn't going to happen, unfortunately. There were those who wanted to sort of make uh, minimal accommodations and they're kind of the ones who prevailed. And then there were those, uh, a small group, but nonetheless some who said, you know, something big is going on here and we need to figure it out and try to uh, try to do what we can to, to, to overcome this, to, 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 to strengthen ourselves. Those eventually became the self-strengtheners, uh, but at the time it was that sort of middle, uh, uh, you know, let's, let's make minimum accommodation kind of position that won out. But yes, there were a lot of debates within the, within the, the political elite. Okay, other questions? Sure. Um, so the next question I have here. So uh, this is a question for you, Ken. Can you touch on China as a semi-colonial, semi-feudal state? What was it about the dynastic rule that made it unable to modernize quickly like Europe had? So that's one of the questions. I can give you a couple more if you're up for it. Sure, let me do that one and then, uh, then we'll take whatever we got. Um, yeah, I mean, the. The, 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 the terminology semi-feudal, um, um, semi-colonial, you know, that's, that's, a, that's, a, uh, that's an effort to capture uh, the complexity of, of the situation in China. Um, China, up until the end of the 18th, beginning of the 19th century, was the most advanced, the most modernized country in the world. Uh, back in the 10th century, uh, a, a commercial revolution took place. They developed banking and finance. They had the biggest industrial complex in the world at the Kiln Center in Jingdezhen. They had uh, uh, systems of, uh, of uh, 
uh, long distance trade of, of banking and credit. They had complex forms of capital organization. Uh, it was a very, very sophisticated economy. And, uh, and we always need to bear that in mind that, what, that, that when the British come in, they're not coming into a primitive backward economic situation. They are, they are subverting and destroying what had been the, the leading edge in global development. Um, so, so, you know, that's, that's, a, that's a, big, uh, a big issue. Um, but there is within the imperial state, you know, there's a difference between the imperial state and the, and the private, if you will, economy. Uh, and the imperial state always had a strategic orientation towards inner Asia, all the threats to Chinese dynasty throughout history came from inner Asia, uh, the, 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 the Turks, the Mongols, the Manchus, all the invaders came not from the sea, but from the interior. And it took a long time for many of the Chinese political leadership to come to grips with the idea that people could show up in boats from the other side of the world and actually be a serious menace. And that slowed down the response. Plus, the bureaucratic system, China had a, 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 an administrative bureaucracy that they had fine tuned for 2000 years at this point. Um, it was just very, very difficult for it to adapt quickly. The contrast with Japan is, is, is the remarkable one because Japan in the mid 19th century changes course overnight and, uh, and, and, and pursues a very aggressive program of modernization and westernization. Uh, uh, but that's a whole different story. And, and you know, we can talk about that, email me about that if you want. But, uh, but yeah, the, 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 the ability of China to, to adapt and to change, you know, it's kind of like trying to turn, you're driving an 18 wheeler and it, you know, you're not turning that sucker on a dime. It, uh, it, it, it took a long time. Uh, and of course, ultimately the imperial system was not capable of adapting and had to be, uh, had to be overthrown. Other questions, Satya? Yes, uh, so there are a lot of good questions in this chat, but unfortunately we won't be able to get to all of them. So I'm picking and choosing. Sure, um, so the Give next two- more for now, okay? Yeah. I, see, I see time wise, we need to get on to the next stage. Right, so we have about six more minutes for the Q and A. So oh, okay. the next two questions that I have are, um, could you make a distinction between Imperial, imperial China uh, whether the Qing dynasty was an empire and how that is similar to and different than imperialism as we know it today. And the second question I have is, why did British want Hong Kong at the time and not any other Chinese city? Sure. Um, let me take that second one because it's, it's a little simpler. Uh, uh, I mean, Hong Kong was, was an island at the entrance to... Uh, the estuary of the Pearl River and the Pearl River was the, the that's where the port of Guangzhou was located so controlling Hong Kong Island, you could control access to uh, the, the most important port up to that point on the South China coast. Um, it, it was a, a, an undeveloped place uh, when the British first started building there they, they basically were starting from scratch. Um, at first, they just had the island, and later in the 1890s, they added uh, uh, Kowloon over on the mainland. Um, but uh, they wanted it for its really for its strategic location more than anything else. I'm not sure that that even at the time they understood quite how important it was going to become as a um, a trade and financial center. But uh, initially, the, the the impetus for it was uh, was strategic. As far as, as uh, you know, China as an empire and what's the difference between that and, and the imperialism we talk about today. Um, of course, uh, using, using the Chinese uh, wouldn't have called, they didn't, they didn't have a word that meant empire. Um, you know, they, they, the, the dynasties were the government, they were the state. Uh, and you had the emperor, the term that, that we translate as emperor, Huangdi, uh, you know, but, but that just because we use that word in English to translate the Chinese term, that creates an equivalence that isn't necessarily uh, um, totally substantive. Okay, uh, you had a system in which you know you had a, a, a ruler, a monarch. You had a, a vast imperial bureaucracy that administered a territory the size of the modern United States. 
uh, with a population uh, in the Qing dynasty, a population of 350 to 400 million people. So it was a, a huge and complex uh, entity. Um, but for the most part, throughout most of Chinese history, Chinese dynasties uh, controlled a, a, a core area of agriculture. Uh, and then they, they wanted to you know, have, have secure uh, peripheries around that. But they didn't project power out into the wider world. They didn't go out and try to take over other people's countries across the ocean or in Africa or something like that. In the 15th century, for a brief period, the Ming Dynasty did actually send out a huge fleet that sailed to Southeast Asia, to India, to the Arabian Gulf, to East Africa. But they didn't conquer people. They didn't uh, take over other territories. They weren't trying to establish Chinese power and domination. They were just learning about other areas, establishing trading relations, gathering information, uh, knowledge. Um, and, uh, you know, the Chinese have never, uh, uh, they've never been an expansionist power beyond sort of their, their, their sort of natural, their natural space. Um, you know, the complexities of the Qing dynasty, uh, it was a multi-ethnic dynasty. It was majority Chinese, vast majority Chinese, but also Manchus and Mongols and Tibetans and Uyghurs and Kazakhs and all these other people. Uh, and today the People's Republic is a, is a, has that, that heritage of, of, of multi-ethnicity. Um, but, you know, the, when we talk about imperialism today and we talk about the Western imperialists, we're talking about the system under which the European countries and later the United States went out into the world to control other countries, to take over other territories, to make them part of their global economic um, systems, uh, you know, so that they became providers of raw materials and markets for manufactured goods. Uh, rather than places that were uh, developing or being developed in their own local uh, interests, you know. So, so I think that's 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 the best way to sort of make that make that comparison. Okay. All right. So, unfortunately, that will have to be the last question for this section. Um, so, uh, if but I do want to say all of these questions that we haven't answered are still excellent. So, if uh, you all want to reach out to Ken. You can email Ken at, at, let me just pull this up. I believe it's uh, khammon at nmsu.edu. You can email your questions to Ken at that email address, kenhammon at nmsu.edu. It's now we can Han, K H A M M O N D at nmsu.edu. There you go. <laughs> there we go. All right. Thank you, comrades. I'll be around. Uh, uh, I'm going to listen to Sheila's part. And if there's things, you know, in the next q and I can help out with, we'll do that too. All right. Well, thank you, Ken. Um, next, we have Sheila, who will be presenting the second lecture on late Qing reforms, the Boxer Rebellion, the fall of the imperial system, and the origins of the revolutionary movement. That's a lot um, to go through, so we'll give the floor to comrade Sheila. <clears throat> Hey everyone, thank you again for joining and just wanted to say that I feel honored to teach this class alongside Comrade Ken. Um, but yeah, I, I think uh, if we could pull up the slides uh, once again. Um, now that we've heard about the Opium Wars and really the beginning of what is known as the Century of Humiliation, where China essentially gets carved up by imperialist powers, um, as well as China's early attempts at reforms we're going to go into this continual pattern of events of China's struggle against a declining imperial system, um, as well as colonialism, which leads to the early roots of uh, what we know to be the socialist revolutionary movement. So we're going to go over the late Qing reforms, the Boxer Rebellion, fall of the imperial system, and the origins of the revolutionary movement. So next slide, please. As we heard in the first half of this class, China which you know, is one of the oldest, most advanced countries, uh, became essentially a semi-colonial state, right? We saw earlier that many Western imperialist powers um, played a part in, in ravaging China. Japan, of course, becomes a key player in the conquest of China and will continue to be so up until World War II, until the end of World War II. 
1894 to 1895, China suffered a humiliating defeat in the Sino-Japanese War, which for the first time shifts the dominant force of, e of the Eastern world from China to Japan. Remember, uh, you know, what Ken mentioned earlier that for centuries, China considered itself sort of this middle kingdom, the, the great power in the region with many of the smaller countries around it, uh, such as Vietnam and Korea that were tributary states to, to China. So this was a, a huge defeat where power goes from China to Japan. And obviously we don't really have the time to go over the details here, um, but I wanted to mention that other imperialist powers were involved in this war. As such, not only was China forced to renounce its relationship with Korea to Japan, uh, which uh, plays a bigger historical relationship between Japan's colonization of the Korean Peninsula, but this also solidified France's control over Vietnam. And most importantly, China was forced to annex Taiwan, which was formerly known as Formosa, to Japan. And Taiwan would then be under Japanese colonial rule until the end of World War II. And uh, again, just like in the earlier slides where we learned about how Hong Kong was taken from China, this is also very crucial historical context in understanding the current day relationship between Taiwan and China. So the 100 day reform was a movement that was a response to this humiliating defeat uh, in the Sino-Japanese war. And this short lived reform movement took place between June to September of 1898. And as we discussed during the Taiping rebellions, right, there was, there was growing discontent and concern over the Qing government's ability to defend China against imperialism. The Qing government was increasingly becoming a puppet regime for the imperialists and thus discontent uh, among the people continues to deepen. And so the, the hundred day reforms was sort of the final attempt at reforming the system until the fall of the imperial government in China. So Kang Yu Wei and Liang Chao Qi or Qi, Qi Chao, um, both philosophers and intellectuals sought out the emperor, uh, the Guangxu emperor to initiate the reform movement. And so this is a picture of, of the emperor at the time. And Tan Si Tong was made the grand secretary to carry out these reforms and consult with the emperor. And these reforms sought to modernize education, right? Using science and math instead of Confucianism, reform the military and simplify the administration and also to modernize the economy, right? They were advocating for things like capitalism. Remember at the time, this is you know, a, a feudalist country. They advocated for building industry and move away from the absolute rule of monarchy and advocating for institutional change. Uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, so these reforms would attempt to change the governing structure to strengthen China in an increasingly global world However, this was a major threat to the Manchus conservatives and the, elite, the elites and the Empress Dowager Cixi. Um, the Guangxu Emperor was under, you know, even though he was the emperor, he was under the great influence of the Empress Dowager. Um, and she still held a great deal of power and had to approve many of the decisions that the emperor made. So he didn't really have full control. And Tan Si Tong, try to further the reform efforts by trying to win over the support of military general Yuan Shi Kai to the reform movement. I'm gonna talk about Yuan a little bit um, because he plays a, a very significant role uh, between now and even after uh, the 1911 uh, revolution. But Yuan was a top military advisor in Korea uh, before and during the time of the Sino-Japanese war. In 1894, he was summoned back to China and was appointed by the Empress Dowager to lead the military commander uh, or to be the lead military commander of the new army. Yuan was considered one of the most important players really of the latter years of the Qing government. And it was important for the reform movement to have support from such a strong leader with military significance because but however, because Yuan is, a, is an opportunist, uh, 
and is always seeking ways to secure political power, um, he ended up turning the information he gathered about the reform movement uh, over to the Empress Dowager. Together, uh, Yuan and, and the Empress organized a coup to suppress the reform movement. Again, I just wanna stress here that Yuan has no loyalties to one side or the other, but as we'll see throughout the next couple of decades, uh, his opportunism takes shape in a very big way. Uh, because of this reactionary coup, Tan along with five other reformists were executed and Kang and Liang who were kind of the main leaders were ex exiled to Japan. Next slide, please. Okay, but of course uh, the rebellions continued and uh, I believe that if there's anything that you probably learned in your history classes about China, it's probably the Boxer Rebellion. Um, the Boxer Rebellion was a popular uprising in Shandong, uh, which is a northern part of China, uh, as, as a response in part to the growing imperialist occupation and the growing religious set settlements uh, brought on by Westerners. So Western missionaries were basically able to bypass uh, any local authorities and were exempt from various local laws, which really fed the deep mistrust and tension uh, in the Chinese people. At the same time, you know, we're seeing China uh, basically deal with severe droughts followed by disastrous flooding, which meant basically even deeper economic strife. And the combination of all these events really make the backdrop of this uprising. And just for the terminology's sake, boxer was a type of martial arts that many rebels practiced. Um, you know, I think some of their slogans or tenets is, you know, anti-foreign missionaries, anti-imperialism, and physical exercise. And the boxers uh, basically mounted a campaign of violent agitation against foreigners, effectively waging a war against all foreign powers. And at first, the Qing government uh, really tried to suppress the movement, mainly due to the pressure of the Western powers. However, the Empress Dowager embraced, ended up embracing the boxers and asked the foreigners to leave the city as soon as possible and declared war on all foreigners. I just wanted to mention here, like she didn't do this because she was a left anti-imperialist, but in some ways she, she really leveraged and used the popular movement behind the boxers to put pressure on the imperialists to loosen their grip and preserve her power. She was not necessarily interested in saving the masses from imperialism, but rather exploit the movement for her own political gain. I also want to note here that Yuan Shikai, the military general I talked about earlier, uh, even though he was once on the side of the empress, he understood that declaring war on the foreigners would be disastrous. Next slide. Next slide, please. Oh, thank you. So the Imperial Army and boxers flooded into Beijing and, oh, yes, uh, flooded into Beijing and besieged foreign embassies um, at the time, you know, or legations, which are basically embassies for almost two months. Uh, well, how did the imperialists respond to this, right? Basically, this rebellion is declaring war. The Qing government is declaring war on these great military powers. So as a result, um, an eight power alliance between France, the US, Britain, Japan, Russia, Germany, Austria, Hungary, and Italy sent their own military forces in to defeat the boxers. Uh, it arrested its sympathizers, including the Qing armies and ended the siege with the boxer protocol of 1901. And the imperialists, of course, even though they went in with great military advantage, they still had to fight against the Qing army and fight against the popular resistance behind the Boxer Rebellion. So they had to fight along the railway line from Tianjin to Beijing. So um, on August 14th, um, uh, 20,000 foreign troops went into Beijing and relieved the legations or the embassies um, and so the Boxer Protocol of 1901 that really ended the rebellion um, outlined the following demands, which were 
China, which were that China had to agree to pay reparations. Um, Anti-foreign groups were completely banned. Military restrictions were imposed upon the Qing dynasty. Foreign troops were permanently garrisoned in Beijing. The Empress Dowager, who fled the scene, actually was able to negotiate her return by spending the last years of her life as a puppet to Western powers. And the Qing government supported the executions of the boxers, and this included anyone who was suspected to be a boxer. Next slide. So after the defeat of the boxers, the Guangxu emperor made really weak attempts to implement a series of new reforms as really a gesture to try to keep things under control. Um, so then we see the abolition of exams in 1905, uh, we see the consultative assemblies, which, which were basically provincial level groups created with the intention of consulting about future government reforms, but really the actual participation was very limited and made up of, you know, a tiny elite. Um, there was still no real attempt to grant any real power to the people. Uh, this was their efforts to salvage the imperial system and create a bourgeois constitutional monarchy, but it really did not take shape in any tangible uh, way. So now we're going to talk about Sun Yat-sen and the Tong Meng Hui. Uh, so the revolutionary movement continues to grow as the Qing government continues to fail and decline in credibility and power. And so Sun Yat-sen is often seen as the father of modern China. Um, and for folks who know anything about Cuba's history, he is seen by the Chinese people similar to how Cubans view Jose Marti. He was born in 1866 in Guangdong province, uh, but he was able to move to Hawaii to study. And many overseas Chinese people who were able to leave China were very critical of the Qing government and its ability to deal with imperialist powers. He became the leader of the secret society Tong Meng Hui, which united many anti-Qing groups, primarily made up of these overseas Chinese people. And these groups advocated for basic uh, bourgeois democratic rights, such as education, suffrage, uh, women's rights, land property. And um, just to kind of bring it back to Marx's writings, these would be considered bourgeois democratic values, which is a process of changing property relations from a decaying feudal system to a capitalistic system. But either way, right, these ideas were very progressive and revolutionary given the context that we're, we're talking about in China. And Sun Yat-sen actually does, did support the ideas of socialism. Um, you know, either way, the rights of these anti-Qing uh, groups really advocated for uh, they were progressive, nationalistic, anti-colonial in nature, and they championed eradicating the backward social customs of Confucianism that maintained feudal class relations. These combined with a program, uh, so, the, so basically all of this became a program that unified China, um, really for the first time since 1839. So, in 1908, Emperor Guangxu and Empress Dowager died within days apart. Historians and scientists confirm that Guangxu was, uh, the emperor was likely poisoned to death while the empress died of old age. Um, and then as the days went on, the Qing government eventually lost credibility among the people, right? They were fed up with imperialist subjugation, corruption, warlordism, and increased poverty. These anti-Qing groups organized dozens of uprisings, eventually leading up to the Wu-Cheng uprising in October 10th of 1911. And this was really the final insurrection that led to the end of the Qing dynasty. So Yuan Shukai, which is again, the, the military general we talked about earlier, was responsible for quelling many of these uprisings. Um, but once again, he turned on the Qing government, realized that it was, you know, continuing to quell the, the uprisings was not going to work, and negotiated a deal with the revolutionary movement players. Next slide. 
1912, the Republic of China was formed. And even though Sun Yat-sen was, was officially elected to be the first president of the Republic of China, the new revolutionary government was at a military disadvantage to uh, the remaining Qing government. So the deal that Yuan negotiated was presidency um, in exchange for the abdication of the emperor and the empress in February of 1912. And after he successfully got them to ab uh, abdicate, Yuan was officially elected to become the first president of the Republic of China. And then I'll talk a little bit about um, Song Jiao Ren, who was one of the Tong Minghui members who were in Yuan's initial cabinet, but he resigned due to his deep differences in governing and strong opposition to Yuan. Um, you know, he wanted to strengthen the revolutionary movement along with his fellow uh, Tong Minghui members. And so they created the Kuomintang Nationalist Party or, you know, abbreviated the KMT, which was founded in August 1913 by both Sun Yat-sen and Song Jiao Ren. And during the 1913 elections, the KMT nationalists were able to secure a majority of seats in the National Assembly. And the goal was, was to be able to limit the control, the total control of the president, especially because Song um, witnessed a lot of this, that Yuan was clearly dominating, was a dominating power among the government. Unfortunately, Song was assassinated soon after by a lone gunman and, and a lot of evidence kind of leads to Yuan plotting the assassination. Um, Yuan then began basically a rampage, a suppression campaign to weaken the KMT, the nationalists. Next slide. So, during the suppression campaign, Yuan basically had unlimited control over the aspects of governing. That meant military, financial, legislative. Um, his power is solidified. And each province, he basically reorganized the governing structure in which each province was kind of under the control of its own military governor, which set the stage for the decline into warlordism after uh, Yuan's death in, in 1916. At the same time, what's happening in the world, right? This is happening during World War I. And it's clear that Japan is, win uh, is winning. Uh, Japan captures Qingdao, which, uh, which was a German controlled colony in China. And Japan's emergence as a key imperialist player meant that they could make claims in China that other imperialists in the region really couldn't oppose. And so uh, the 21 demands uh, that, um, that Japan wanted become kind of this big um, thing that many anti-imperialists, you know, reference um, in the later movement. But the 21 demands that Japan wanted, um, I'm just going to outline the things that they were demanding. So they wanted to control additional territories. They wanted to have control over the administrative, economic, and domestic affairs. They wanted to have Japanese advisors involved in China's political and financial and military affairs and the right of ownership of land uh, for building things such as Japanese hospitals, schools, and churches. And despite the widespread resistance to the 21 demands, which were international in scope, including Chinese students abroad and even provincial leaders, Yuan uh, Shikai still signed still agreed to the 21 demands, which led to the rapid decline of his popularity and his rule. Uh, he then later uh, abolishes the Republic. Yuan abolishes the Republic uh, and restores monarchical rule and declares himself emperor. Um, all of these events combined, the warlordism, the further imperialist war, Yuan's dictatorship led to widespread provincial rebellions. And because Yuan had become so increasingly unpopular, he ended up abdicating his throne in 1916. Um, and he shortly, he died shortly in June of 1916 from a chronic illness that he was battling. And again, all these events depict the continual struggle between imperialism, national liberation and corruption. And China continues to decline into a deep state of instability. And 
Because of this, Yuan's death created a vacuum, leading to basically a decade-long period uh, where China declines into a warlord rule and again, occupation by the imperialists. Next slide, please. Okay, so the public feeling of uh, the national humiliation after the happenings of World War I, compounded by the economic conditions that China had to endure, began to take form in a cultural movement. In addition to the public feelings of needing to defend China against imperialism, at the same time, there were many uh, Chinese people who were living abroad, overseas Chinese people, who were exposed to Western education, society, um, and they really pushed for new forms of governing and democratic values, right? During this time, there was a broadening of the base of mass participation. This is when we get mass political organizations such as trade unions, um, both a rising anti-imperialist consciousness and the beginning of mass mobilization take shape during this time. Um, you know, people who are a part of this movement uh, wanted to push the idea that politics is not just limited to the elite. Um, the, the rising tide of revolutionary thought and mobilization was considered, you know, this period was really considered the new culture movement. And many of the cultural critiques that came out of this period, for example, uh, the Baihua movement, uh, which advocated for Chinese writings to be written in a way that's actually spoken instead of classical um, language. And if, I don't know if folks here know, you know, speak or read Chinese, but the way you speak it is very, very different from the way you write Chinese. Um, and so in many ways, the movement at this time uh, rejected any of the old traditional order, um, was, was kind of viewing anything of the old traditional order as, as reminiscent of the imperial system. And the new culture movement really had been percolating since the signing of the Japanese, uh, J the Japan's 21 demands, and probably even before. Um, the new culture movement rejected Confucianism and traditionalism. Uh, there are common themes here among all of the rebellion movements about advancing society beyond Confucianism and feudalism. This was a movement led by students and was highly influenced by Western liberalism uh, of freedom and democracy. Um, but also during this time, we see anarchism and radical thought um, coming into play, right? So Liu Shifu is an example of a Chinese anarchist and internationalist who was a representative figure of the revolutionary movement at the time. And he had connections to groups in Japan uh, and Paris. Um, we'll move to the next slide, please. And again, because of this deep uh, rejection of Confucianism and warlordism, a lot of the critiques by radical intellectuals of the traditional culture, uh, as mentioned in the previous slide, they saw this as the culture of imperial power and elitism you know, just like the classical language that we spoke about, the examinations, um, Confucianism, and many ideas that came out of this period was about things such as gender equality, right? Against foot biting, um, advocating for marriage reform. They were talking about things like uh, engaging with issues of literacy in the masses, right? Uh, at this time, China is massively illiterate, um, unless you were of an, an elite class, if you were a of the gentry. Um, mass participation, again, was a huge part of this movement that really hadn't been seen before. They advocated for modernizing education. Um, and you can see as I go through this, like there are themes of just these types of rights that kind of come up in all of even the, the reform movements prior to it, such as you know modernizing education. Um, a lot of intellectuals uh, radical intellectuals were reading translations of European literature. And this period was critical for the debating and generating of revolutionary ideas for what is the path forward for China uh, beyond feudalism, beyond imperialism. And during this time in the late 1910s, two major 
uh, events, worldwide events collide that really elevate the consciousness of the people. The first is the impact of the Bolshevik Revolution of 1917, which served as a beacon of inspiration for revolutionary change. For the first time um, in history, we see a socialist revolution in also a country that was, was quite backwards. Uh, the second major event is the betrayal uh, at Versailles. You know, the Treaty of Versailles that ends um, World War uh, World War One, and the signing of Versailles really exposes the bankruptcy of liberal bourgeois democracy and the selling out of China once again. Um, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about uh, Versailles in the next slide, um, but um, I'm just going to wrap up this point here. Um, actually, never mind. Let's go to the next slide. Okay, so. Here we are now at the May 4th movement. And the May 4th movement was really a response to, again, the signing of the Treaty of Versailles, which was um, signed in 1919, which again ended World War I. <clears throat> so imperialist countries uh, that had spheres of influence in China could no longer maintain control, right? Uh, these were the countries that lost, right? Germany was defeated. Uh, and in the treaty, basically it states that Japan gets to maintain control over territories in China that were previously held by Germany. And so the May 4th movement was a, a response to this. The movement preceding this event was really built in the same way, the same anti-imperialist vein, um, you know, just like the, the, the Japan's 21 demands. So what happened on May 4th, right? On May 4th, 3,000 college students in Beijing occupied the streets of Tiananmen Square to protest the decision of Versailles. Um, during this time, uh, students were so deeply outraged that about the selling out of China that the students marched to the home of the foreign minister who they blamed uh, for being responsible for selling out China to Japan. Uh, they broke into his home and burned his house down. And this is really just to mark the level of rage people had because of this, this, um, you know, this betrayal, uh, you know, it's, it's like, as we've seen, it's one thing after another, um, like just parts of China getting carved out. And days later, the first citywide student organizations in China's history was created and Beijing students continued to protest, hold street meetings and push for boycotts against Japanese goods. Uh, all things that we still do today when we fight imperialism. Um, and, you know, there were also, like, even though this was led by students, it also um, won broad support of workers, right? So what began as a student movement quickly uh, won enormous support from new merchants, industrialists, urban workers. And in early June, up to 100,000 industrial workers in Shanghai declared a week-long general strike to show their contempt for the government suppression of Beijing students and arrests of the students. Uh, in addition to, uh, to uh, the list of demands um, were the demands for higher wages, better working conditions, and an end to exploitation. So um, we're gonna end here with the May 4th movement, but I just wanted to close out um, by saying that, you know, today we really covered how China became a pawn to imperialist conquest for more colonies and how that propelled China into this deep semi-colonial state for over a century of time, you know, battling chronic instability uh, into uh, governing warlordism. And we discussed many, many rebellions and uprisings that took place in China in the midst of colonial rule under a puppet government uh, of the Qing dynasty and how that led to the overthrow of the Qing government. Um, and so I think, you know, this is a lot of information, historical information, but it's really crucial context for understanding why China is the way it is today. Thank you so much, Sheila. Um, yeah, thank you for having such a thorough presentation because like you said, it is very important for um, understanding the context and China today. Um, so now we're going to have time for questions and answers. Um, we just want to encourage people to continue asking questions in the chat if possible. And let's see. So um, 
Yeah, so the first few questions are about the Boxer Rebellion and maybe expanding a little bit more about that. So what would you say is the overall significance and impact of the Boxer Rebellion on China? Um, what was the progressive impact of the rebellion for China? And then are there any similarities between the way the Boxer Rebellion was crushed by foreign military intervention and the way the USSR was invaded by foreign powers? And do you think the foreign powers invaded China because they feared an international anti-colonial movement in their empires? Yeah, I mean, the effects of the Boxer Rebellion, and let me know if I'm not answering these questions in full, um, and Ken can also jump in. But I think the effects of the Boxer Re Rebellion was, it was humiliating. I mean, I, I think I, we echo the century of humiliation, but eight major powers went into China and and broke up this, this massive rebellion. So it was a huge impact. Um, and China ended up having to pay um, a lot for this. Um, and then the other question, sorry, what was the second question? Sorry about that. Yeah, so um, do you think the foreign powers invaded China because they feared an international anti-colonial movement in their empires? I mean, I think that's a part of it. Um, of course, I think anytime an imperialist power tries to conquer a land, that's always the fear is uprising. And so um, a part of it, a part of an imperialist project is to be able to crush any kind of grassroots movement. So um, I don't think that was the principal goal. The goal is to be able to have control over China and loot it for everything that they have, um, just like any other imperialist nation. But um, you know, I, I think that they were afraid of of, um, of major uprisings. I think a, a, main, a major part of why the Qing government even still existed was that it could still kind of present as a unifying control over China, even though so many parts of China were already carved out for, for imperialists. I don't know if Ken has anything to add to that, but, um, but yeah, that's my take on it. Um, yeah, Ken, did you want to add to that or is that, no? Okay. <laughs> no, I think that's, I think that's excellent. Good. Yeah, great. And then um, another question is, were radical ideas and practices happening across the country or um, was it mostly just in urban areas? And then uh, another question was about where does the history of Chinese migration to California fit in um, the story? Those are great questions. Um, I want to say, at least during this time period, it really was concentrated. Um, I would say in the urban areas, only because a lot of the people who were involved in this radical thinking were people who were able to read, um, who were educated elites, people who were able to um, travel to Western countries and and read and and, and educate. So um, I, I I wouldn't say that there wasn't radical ideas in in other parts of, of, of China, but I think during this time, the most prominent like, like leaders of the radical intellectual movement were people who at least were educated um, and were able to like leave China and be exposed to these Western ideas. Um, and then in terms of Chinese migration, yeah, I mean, uh, basically the, the trade of coolies, which is basically Chinese uh, immigrant labor, migrant labor, began in the early 1800s. Um, I can't remember if it was before or after the Opium Wars, but it, it began there. Uh, started, um, I think the first coolie ship went to Cuba actually, um, and then to California. So um, migrant labor is a big part of, of the history of, of, Chinese, um, of Chinese immigration, but also the effects of imperialism. Yeah, for sure. Thank you for that answer. Um, let's see. And then um, what were Sun Yat-sen and the KMT doing from 1912 to 1919 under nationalist oppression from that regime? Um, um, let's I, just go with that. I believe Sun Yat-sen actually fled uh, and, and went into exile. 
during that time. Um, but I don't know. Ken, do you do you know specifically? Yeah, what the uh, the after after 1912, when when Sun is uh, is shunted aside by Yuan Shikai in, in 1912, um, he goes uh, he goes overseas for a little bit. But pretty soon, the nationalists uh, settle in uh, in southern China in Guangdong Province, and uh, uh, that becomes really their base of operations. So that when um, when China begins to fragment, especially from 1916 on, Guangdong really becomes sort of the nationalist zone. They controlled the local government there in, uh, in Guangzhou City uh, and uh, had a lot of uh, presence in the countryside. That's where, we'll talk a little bit about this uh, next week, but that's where they established their military academy. Um, they really built up their, their organization uh, in in the south, uh, and that becomes their their base of operations. Great, thank you. And then um, we'll give you two questions real quick. So, can you expand more on the link between the first strains of Chinese Marxism and the new culture movement? And then also another question is: as far as I understand, the May Fourth Movement was a major happening to set the conditions for the Chinese Communist Party foundation. Is that right? Was the movement completely spontaneous or had any political forces already organized at that time? Yeah, so those two questions um, are kind of, uh, they kind of answer each other because the May 4th movement, because people were exposed to um, Western literature, they were also reading Marx, right? They were also reading, um, you know, Marx, they were inspired by the Bolsheviks. So uh, it, it is, I think it is heavily, um, you know, this new culture movement, the May 4th movement lays the foundation really for um, the beginnings of the formation of the Communist Party. Um, so yeah, we'll actually talk a lot more about that in the next class. So I won't go into it too much, but the short answer is yes. Okay, great, thank you. Um, and then, let's see, when warlords fought in China, did they fall out based on ethnic lines and did they all continue to identify as being Chinese? Um, what was the state of landlordism at the time of May 4th? And then this is kind of a little bit um, separate, but uh, someone's asking for more elaboration on the Sino-Japanese War. Um. I don't know too much about the specifics about the provincial divides, but I think it was just whoever had military, who had the military control to take uh, control of the province. Um, so it just, it, it, it would differ province by province, but I, I wouldn't, I guess I would imagine that um, provinces that had a, a ethnic minor, major, a majority that um, perhaps it was ruled by, uh, by those ethnic lines, but, um, I'll defer that question to Ken, but the second part of the question about what was warlord, warlordism looking like in the 1919, uh, during the time of the May 4th movement, again, uh, Yuan Shikai had died, right? Uh, which left a huge vacuum. So warlordism was was uh, ripe. It was, it was happening all over. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, that was the way China was operating for, at least the decade after his death in, in 1916. Um, and then in terms of the Sino-Japanese war, yeah, it's a little complicated because it also, like other other key players, I think, um, you know, the French, uh, I don't know, I mean, basically what happened in the Sino-Japanese war was that, and the reason why I mentioned earlier that France was uh, able to take control of Vietnam was because China in a desperate, plea to defeat the Japanese, they made a deal, China made a deal with, with Western imperialists um, to try to fight um, the Japanese um, and, and con maintain control over, over China. But of course, in order to seek help from Western imperialist powers, they had to make some concessions. So I think that's a, a big part of it. I think the Sino-Japanese war also has a lot to do with um, also tangentially Japan's um, you know, I think actually directly after the Sino-Japanese War was the Japanese Russo War. So um, 
Japan and Russia going into war against each other, also about the Korean Peninsula. So it's there's a lot to the the Sino-Japanese War, um, but yeah. I don't know if Ken, you have anything to add to any of that. Well, just, no, I think you just touched on on the key there that uh, which is that uh, uh, really the the, the Sino-Japanese War is a is one step in Japan's uh, imperialist aggression uh, against uh, Korea, that uh, Korea, like Vietnam, had a long historical relationship with China. And just as the French needed to break away, break Vietnam away from China in the South, Japan needed to, to force China to renounce its close relationship with Korea. And that's really what, what the, the War of 1894-95 was about. Great, thank you. So we are going to wrap up um, this Q&A session, but just as a reminder, um, we are keeping track of all the questions that were asked in the chat and uh, we'll probably respond via email to answer some of these. So thank you for everyone who has been asking questions and participating and watching. Um, and I am going to close out this session and pass the floor to Satya, who will close us out. Thank you so much to Ken and Sheila uh, for their excellent presentations and for everyone who asked questions uh, and made comments today in the discussion. Uh, we hope you will all join us uh, for next week's class, which will be on May 24th. Uh, that class will focus on national liberation through class struggle. Uh, it covers the period between 1919 and 1949, and it's going to be taught by PSL members. Once again, I'm going to uh, go through um, the dates for uh, when all the next four classes will be. So this is the schedule. So May 24th is the next class. Um, it covers the period between 1919-1949. It's gonna uh, cover the national liberation struggle. It's gonna be taught by PSL members. And then the class after that one uh, will be on May 31st. Um, the period that that's gonna cover is 1949 through 1979. Uh, the, t t the Twin Tasks of the Revolution. Uh, this will also be taught by PSL members. And then uh, the fourth class will be on June 7th, um, is China Capitalist on China's Socialist Market Economy and Quest Towards Socialism, taught by the Chow Collective. And the last, the final class will also will be on June 14th. Um, and this will cover China and the Global South, internationalism and multilateralism amidst U.S. aggression. This will be taught by the Child Collective. Great. And uh, just a few reminders for upcoming events this week. Every Thursday, the Party for Socialism and Liberation presents a national live stream forum. You can still view last week's live stream entitled Coronavirus and the Epidemic of Racism in Capitalist America on YouTube and Facebook. Tune in this Thursday, May 21st for this week's live stream. Also, for those who missed the earlier announcement, uh, join us in demanding the cancellation of rents and mortgages in a National Day of Action on May 30th. Visit canceltherents.org to sign the petition, find an action, and read more about the Day of Action. And please be sure to follow us on social media at PSL Web and visit liberationnews.org for our current take, our take on current events. And remember, thinking about socialism is good. Thinking and talking about socialism is better. But building a revolutionary socialist party is best of all. If you're interested in joining the PSL, you can apply online today at pslweb.org backslash join. Thank you all for tuning in. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. See you next week. <laughs>